was hoping somehow I could share a video clip with you, but the copyright laws prevent me from doing so. But on the way here, I thought, mm, I think there's a way around that. And then I found there wasn't, so I guess I'll just have to tell you about it, and you can go look at it afterwards. Uh, it was really an inspiring experience for me. <clears throat> Jonathan, who was a shy, um, boyish Brit, he seemed to be not dressed as appropriately as his singing partner, Charlotte. They appeared on Britain's Got Talent, and maybe you saw them. When they came in, Simon Cowell was up to his usual, usual sarcasm when he said, uh, whispering to Amanda Holden, just when you think things couldn't get any worse, after a clipped interview which could only be described as um, affected politeness, Simon wished them good luck. Then the music began, but when the song erupted out of their hearts, out of their lips, it was a moving experience for those who watched it uh, and the video clip and for those who were in the audience itself. Uh, there were some people who were, you know, you could, as the camera panned through the audience, you could see that some of them were about as disinterested as uh, Simon Cowell, but once they started singing, um, these people were sitting forward in their seats. They were, some of the ladies had tears in their eyes and you could tell that they had, their, their hearts had been captivated by the music. And when it was all over, even Simon Cowell joined for the standing ovation. So if you uh, are home and you have access to the internet, I would encourage you if you'd like to listen to this uh, piece that um, you Google just Jonathan and Charlotte and um, the, the English, uh, is that what they call it? Britain's Got Talent, and you'll find the, the piece there. Well, I noticed when I was, um, when you go online and you see how many people responded, this was sung, I think, in 19, or 2012. Now it's 2019. Um, the, the people who have responded are over 119 million people. So anyway, just an encouragement to, um, to take that in. And I, I have to confess, I was moved to tears as I listened to them sing the song, the prayer. And the lyrics are, um, I guess, is it Celian Dion, is that her name? and jo Josh Gorbin, they sang the song, but I think Charlotte and Jonathan blew, blew them away. It's just a moving experience. But here are the lyrics. I pray that you'll be our eyes and watch us where we go and help us be wise in times when we don't know. Let this be our prayer when we lose our way. Lead us to the place. Guide us with your grace to a place where we'll be safe. I pray we'll find your light and hold it in our hearts. When stars go out each night, let this be our prayer. When shadows fill our day, lead us to a place. Guide us with your grace. Give us faith so we'll be safe. We ask that life be kind and watch us from above. We hope each soul will find another to love. Let this be our prayer, just like every child needs to find a place. Guide us with your grace. Give us the faith so we'll be safe. I thought it was a good analogy to, to maybe even a metaphor to think about um, if we were to be able to sing like they could and um, lead people to praise Christ in a setting like that. You know, it will happen in the new earth of course, but just thinking about who would correspond to Simon Cowell, I'm not diminishing him, but it seems like he represented what Lucifer might have, uh, his attitude might have been after his fall. Uh, he couldn't help himself but bow down like the rest of those who were, who will acknowledge Christ's sovereignty, but he will do it with, uh, with reservations, um, 
impugning motives and, and challenging Christ's right to receive this worship. But the, the, we're told, I think it's the Bible that says it, I hath not seen nor ear heard nor hath entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them. Um, if you come to prayer meeting on Wednesday night, you'll, sing, you'll see some of the people who probably shouldn't be in the choir. But there's going to come a time, right, when we'll all be in the choir. We'll have voices that maybe not to become proud or anything, but to equal Jonathan and, and um, Charlotte's voices. In fact, as they were being interviewed after the, uh, the, the, the song, uh, each one said, you know, gave him the pass, and Simon Cowell had to live up to his reputation. And he sa said to Jonathan, you've got an incredible voice, an incredible voice. And then he said, there may come a time when you need to leave Charlotte behind. She's got a good voice, but anyway, it was hurtful as Simon can be hurtful. But um, then there won't be any bad voices, right? We'll all be able to sing with our heart and um, it, it'll be an amazing experience. But what would have happened if those who were in the audience could sing like Charlotte and Jonathan? Man, that would have been something to behold. Well, we're going to have that time. And uh, so this, this um, sermon is really about prayer. And uh, what motivated me to preach this sermon was um, last Sabbath I was in, in Bisbee. I think it was at, yeah, it was on Sabbath, during Sabbath school. Sylvia, if any of you know Sylvia, she's uh, married to Ludo. She was describing how valuable an experience it was to read chapter 11, is it, or 12? I forget. In Steps to Christ, it's called The Privilege of Prayer. So I did that, and this is what I wanted to share with you as a result of that. Um, so I don't remember when it was, some time ago, I saw my name in print. And it wasn't a letter addressed to me, it was just a, a story. And of course, that gripped my attention. I was all ears. But it wasn't me that the article was about. Um, this guy was a, also a pastor from another church with the same name. He had a 14-year-old son named Royce, and his dad had gone to overseas somewhere, I forget, oh, it was in, it was Rome. And his dad was a pastor, and he was ministering to some of the um, people on, on the lower end of the social economic spectrum. <clears throat> but while he was gone, his, dad, his son, Royce, was sleeping. But he woke up around a little bit after 2 o'clock, and he was impressed that he should pray for his father. So he did. He didn't know what, what it was, but he prayed for his father's safety because that was how he was impressed. Well, once he completed his prayer, he felt everything was okay, and he went to sleep. Well, Royce's father continued the story. He called home from Italy to tell his wife about his experience that morning. He'd been invited to Rome to minister uh, among people who had come to Italy, mostly as house servants. The day before I was scheduled to depart for home, the director of the Bible school wondered if I would enjoy a trip to Venice, and I readily agreed. We would leave at 6 o'clock the next morning, traveling north. <clears throat> we made our way down. <clears throat> Pardon me, I guess I'm going to have to water the horse. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> we made our way out of Rome to the, as the city was awakening, he said. Soon the city was behind us. And we were maneuvering through the mountains on the freeway. The view to the right was spectacular. Uh, if you've ever been in Europe and the Swiss Alps or the French Alps, it's just mind-blowing. And so they were driving through the Alps, and he was surrounded by semi-trucks. In two hours, they would arrive in Venice, and he was imagining what it would be like, the gondolas taking us down the water, uh, the water streets. Immediately, there was a noise. The hiss was followed immediately by a pop that jolted me into reality, he says. In an instant, the car, the inside of the car was filled with steam, and he couldn't even see the guys in the front seat. 
The vehicle swerved. Though I didn't know it at the time, the boiling water from a broken hose engulfed the driver's feet. It was only, it was the only time in my life I ever thought I was gonna die. He said I braced myself for the inevitable, but somehow the driver was able to gain control of the vehicle and we eventually came to a stop nestled against the guardrail. I looked at my watch. It was a few minutes after nine in Italy but it was just after 2 a.m. in Nixon, Missouri, where his son was on his knees praying for his father because he sensed he was in some kind of danger. Well, Paul recounts his prayer. We used it for our scripture reading, and I wanted to share um, the verse from the Message Bible. I'm not really, uh, those of you who are getting acquainted with me know that I'm really Paraphrasers are valuable, but they're not what you want to base your theology on. But sometimes they get it right. And uh, it, it'll always be one of my favorite passages in Romans chapter 12, 1, where Paul says, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. I think that captures the idea. <clears throat> and here in, in the Message Bible, I think it captures the idea. My response is to get down on my knees before the Father, this magnificent Father who parcels out all heaven and earth. I ask him to strengthen you by his spirit, not a brute strength, but a glorious inner strength, that Christ will live in you as you open the door and invite him in. And I ask him that with both feet planted firmly on love, you'll be able to take in with all followers of Jesus the extravagant dimensions of Christ's love. Reach out and experience the breadth, test its length, plummets depths, rise to the heights. God can do anything, you know, far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. He does it not by pushing us around, but by working within us, his spirit deeply and gently within us. Well, is not is not this the prayer that our Heavenly Father delights to honor and make a reality in our life? It is a petition that God would act on behalf of those church members, not because they are without fault or because they are perfect. And just as Jonathan, if, if, how many of you saw the video clip of Jonathan and Charlotte? Any? Am I the only one? My wife? I know she did. Well, you're going to have to see it. It's great. But I thought that Jonathan, in his appearance, really reflected what we are like. We're... We're not perfect, we're on the path, but there's still sinful nature within us that, you know, Jesus reads our hearts and he sees our inborn weaknesses, our propensities, but he doesn't, he doesn't dismiss us. Um, he is planted within our heart, the desire to reach out. So this, um, this, affection that God has for us is not wimpy affection. It's not timid and ineffectual. In his prayer, Paul asks God to strengthen these Ephesians by his spirit. And there are two words in this uh, passage that are translated strength, but are not from the same Greek word. The first is dunamis, which you're familiar with. The other, according to a Greek pastor, who's a theologian, his name is uh, Zodiatus, he says it is the strongest word available to indicate strength or ability. So God's love for us, the dimensions or the extra extravagant dimensions of Christ's love are much, much stronger than the fearlessness of a Marine. Christ's love is much more effective as a means of governing large populations than the iron monarchy of Rome and is much, source, much more successful as a method of motivating people than large amounts of money. And it's that kind of love that he wants us to experience. Another story I ran across was about an Australian uh, Christian author. His name was John Dixon. He came to Christ in his teenage years. Um, there was a lady by the name of Glenda. She was matronly, just... Uh, 
older mother, maybe her kids were about the age of these kids, or maybe she, they were older. But anyway, she uh, opened her home to them. <clears throat> and some of the kids were some of the worst ones in the public school. And the public school apparently made provision, had provision for uh, the students to take a break from the academics and go to a home and have some spiritual nurture. Well, anyway, um, she opened her home, and they were coming to her home. And eventually, she invited her whole class on Friday afternoons for lunch and honest conversation about Jesus. Dixon writes of his experience. So we went back the next Friday and the next Friday and the next Friday. Slowly but surely, the Jesus stuff became as important as the food. So we became, so, so we came with more and more friends. Some of these 15-year-olds were the worst sinners in school, but Glenda opened her home and her heart every Friday afternoon and treated us like we were family. There was one night when one of our friends, his name was Daniel, and you'll remember this because Daniel refused to be contaminated by the alcohol in Babylon. Well, this Daniel refused to resist the temptation to be contaminated by alcohol, and he got soused. He was drunker than a skunk. They didn't know what to do with him. <clears throat> Their dad, uh, his dad was in the army, and he was, you know, it's, he was really a down-to-business guy, and he wouldn't tolerate any of this kind of stuff, so they knew that they couldn't take him to his home. So they thought it was near midnight, but they were going to take him to Glenda's home because she had opened her home and her heart to him or to them. And so there was a light on, and apparently a lot of cars around, and there was some kind of dinner party, and it hadn't gotten over yet, but Brenda, or Glenda came to the door, and uh, they explained what was going on, and uh, she said, throw, uh, um, she invited them to come in to the back of their house. She went and got some clothes and said, throw, throw them in the shower, clean them up, and just put them to bed, and we'll sort things out in the morning. So that's what they did. The next morning, they went back to Glenda's house around 10 o'clock to pick Daniel up. He was sitting at the kitchen table, and Glenda was making him breakfast, and they were having a good chat. Well, he says, we took Daniel to Glenda's house because she had left a real impression on us that Christians actually like sinners. We had no doubt that she hated our drinking habits. She was a teetotaler and talked openly about avoiding alcohol. But even in that situation, her first instinct was not to condemn but to love us more, and it was extraordinary. After about six months of scripture classes, Friday afternoon events, and the incident with Daniel, we found ourselves thinking that Jesus was real. He was inescapable, that he's powerful. So about six months into it, about five of us became Christians. We really surrendered our hearts to Christ's lordship and accepted his mercy. Years later, um, this Australian by the name of John, I think it was, right? Uh, he was led into ministry and he thought, you know, I think I need to go see Glenda and find out what kind of strategy she had because it worked. It really did. So they went to her and, or he went to her and talked to her and asked her the questions and the secret of her ministry, she said, without batting an eye, she said, is prayer. She didn't offer a method. She didn't offer a strategy other than praying. He said he was disappointed, but she continued. That year, she explained, a bunch of us who thought, thought or taught scripture decided to make it a year of prayer just to plead the Lord of the harvest to do something special. And we did. By the end of the year, there you were confessing Jesus. For an activist like me, that was a poignant lesson. In the end, the harvest is God's. It's not mine. It's not my creativity. It's not my skill. It's God's. We just have to bring our ministry to God and cry out for him to give us success. You know, it's so easy to fall into that trap, isn't it? We have to find a method. We have to bring an evangelist in. Um, we need to process it in our board meeting, in our evangelism committee. Uh, how about just following her example, praying? 
praying consistently that the Lord will lead us to how he wants us to make an impact in our community. Another pastor by the name of Tony Evans was in Columbia, South Carolina to preach a crusade being held at the University of South Carolina football field. Thousands had gathered and it was, uh, I don't know if it was monsoon season. <laughs> we have that here, I don't know if they have it there, but it was, a storm was predicted to arrive exactly at the same time that these meetings were supposed to start. So some of those who were involved in the planning, they decided to get together and pray which they did. I don't know how many were there. There were some pastors. There was a girl or a woman named Linda. So the pastors prayed safe prayers, and Linda prayed, and I'll have to share that with you. Um, went something like this. Lord, thousands have gathered to hear the good news about your son. It would be a shame on your name for us to have all these unbelievers go without the gospel when you control the weather and you don't stop it. In the name of Jesus, address this storm. And so ended the meeting. So they went back into the crowd, sat in their seats. Uh, umbrellas started pop popping up. Uh, the person who was sitting next to Linda popped his umbrella up and offered it to her, but she wasn't having anything to do with it because she knew that the Lord was going to intervene. And what happened is the storm got to the one end of the uh, stadium, and it parted and it went around the, the building, and then it got back together after it passed the, the building. Well, God does amazing things. He's able to part the Red Sea. He parted the storm, I guess you could say. What happens, though, when we pray and nothing happens? Somebody was looking through the diary of George Mueller and uh, for your information, I was interested, so I looked it up. He was born in 1805 and passed away in 1898. So as you'll discover from part of the story, he was alive when our spiritual pioneers were alive. And uh, he's described as a Christian social reformer, according to what I read. And in November 1844, ring a bell? He began to pray for the conversion of five people. A year and a half later, the first one gave his heart to Christ. Five years passed, the second one gave his heart to Christ. And George Mueller prayed every day for all five of them. So six, year, six years passed, and the th third one gave his heart to Christ. And he kept on praying and praying and praying. And eventually he passed away. I'm not sure what time lapse there was between him passing away, but eventually the other two gave their hearts to Christ. Think about that, parents. Sometimes our children, as hard as we may have worked, as earnestly as we've prayed for them, um, I don't know that we'd ever give in to the temptation to stop praying for them, but we need to cling to God's promises that he will do what we ask him to do. And of course, he's not into doing full Nelsons on people, forcing people to accept him. He is into alluring them, drawing them, putting people in their path, putting influences in their life. And God loves your kids just as much as any other parent's child. So don't give up praying because he'll come through for us um, if, if, their, if their hearts do not remain, I mean, we have to allow for that, right? Uh, if their hearts do not remain hardened after he's done his best for them. What storms do you face in life? What challenges at work? Unfulfilled dreams sending your children to a Christian school? An unfulfilling marriage? Incurable illness that threatens you? or uh, threatens to rob you of your joy, not enough money to pay the bills, we need to soak our hearts in Jesus' ministry. So that the, the prayer that, inspire, or that, 
the motivation that Paul experienced to pray on behalf of the Ephesians may be fulfilled in us. And so when we have Christ dwelling within our hearts, we can pray like Paul. We can pray like George Mueller. We can see God do amazing things. And I would encourage you to do what I was inspired to do. And I'm sure many of you have read Steps to Christ multiple times. But I would encourage you to read the chapter, The Privilege of Prayer. And I'm just going to whet your appetite with a few thoughts from that where she says we need to pour out our hearts to him. What does that mean, to pour out our hearts? It's not just repeating phrases that we've repeated for years and years and years. It almost sounds like our hearts break. Maybe it might lead us to weep about the people we pray about, particularly our children. On page 97, she says, we may have no remarkable evidence at the time that the face of our Redeemer is bending over us in compassion and love, but it is even so. Now, we know that Jesus is confined to a human body, but so when it speaks like this, it's really speaking of his other person, his other self, the other comforter. The Holy Spirit is capable of hovering over you in Sierra Vista and me in Tucson, and uh, with compassion. Another thought, nothing that in any way concerns our peace is too small for him to notice. No sincere prayer escape the lips in which he takes no immediate interest. Isn't that encouraging? He's not waiting for the right time for him to get involved. He's immediately responsive to that. Maybe part of it is ministering to us to assure us that he hears our prayer, that he's going to do something about it, that he's going to intervene in the appropriate way. One last one. God is a tender, merciful father. He is their best friend. He expects to bless and comfort them, filling their hearts with joy and love. <clears throat> you know, I grew up without a father. I didn't even have a stepfather. Uh, but I've been, I've resolved, because of what I've seen, to be a good dad. I've done my best, just like you have. Not perfect, and uh, I'm just grateful that my dad wasn't my mentor, that I, I'm glad that I didn't know him, because I would have had a twisted view of what a father is like. But God is a tender merciful father. He's divested of the weaknesses of the worst of the fathers that there are. And so if we find something in that chapter that stirs our heart, should not we expect, and I'm going to use this phrase, to be exponentially blessed? You know, there's the part you can add, there's the parts that you can multiply, but when it's to the tenth power or third power, it's exponential. And as we open our hearts to Jesus, as we pray, as we read this chapter, if that's where the Lord leads you, certainly we should be able to expect, if he takes an immediate interest in us, and he wants to fill our hearts with love and joy, we should, be, we should expect to be exponentially blessed. Our Father in heaven, we are thrilled with stories we hear about how you intervene on behalf of fallen man. And broken though we are, we know that that's the reason Jesus came into this world, to seek us, to find us, to transform us, to give us hope, to make us partners with himself. We pray that you'll stir our hearts to a renewed and deeper experience praying for people. We all have people on our list. Help us to be hopeful, to believe, to persevere. We pray also that you will lead this church collectively, individually, knowing how to minister to needs. We're grateful for what those who do reaching out into the community already are doing. And we know that you're blessing through that. We just pray that 
it will be your direction, not a committee's idea or the pastor's idea or the personal ministry's idea, but you will lead us collectively to focus on what you want us to, to do together. We're grateful that you hear our prayers. We're grateful that you're even more concerned about the things that move us. We know that prayer doesn't change you. It transforms us. And we pray that you'll continue your work of grace in us as we become more and more like Jesus, praying like him, ministering like him, serving like him. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen.